there's a game that I love to play when I'm sitting next to somebody that I don't know on an airplane. I bet you can't guess what I do. Like, doctor, no. Lawyer, no. Engineer, no. So I drop a couple hints. I climb trees. So like, you're a tree trimmer? I'm like, I'm a sloth scientist. They're like, get out of here. No way. Don't believe it. And I'm like, not only am I a sloth scientist, I specialize in studying the sleep patterns of wild sloths. At this point, they're convinced that I'm a lying liar, and they're like, there's no way you do that. So I pull up my phone, I show them some pictures, I'm like, no, I really am the sloth sleuth. And they're like, that's a job? How in the heck did you get into studying sloths? That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard of. And I'm like, it's actually kind of a funny story. I got into studying sloths kind of as a joke. I was in Panama working for a TV program, and a scientist and I were joking about it, saying, you know, why is it that these sloths poop on the ground? Which is a real story. They actually, they live their whole life in the canopy, except once a week, sloths climb all the way down out of the tree, they dig a little hole, they go to the bathroom, they bury it, they crawl back up the tree, and they live their life. And what's weird about this is that they're a canopy mammal, they live up there their whole life, and they actually get killed going to the bathroom all the time. What the heck? Why would they just poop in the trees like a monkey? It's such a paradox, and tropical scientists all joke about this, and so we're all laughing, having some drinks about it. And it kind of got me thinking, I was like, you know, I can climb trees. Wouldn't it be funny to try to answer that? So I started working with sloths like 13 years ago, and I've had a great time since then. I've learned some pretty cool stuff. And the funny thing is, catching sloths is one thing that people always ask me, like, oh, you must have chose sloths because they're so slow and they're so easy to catch. Not exactly. Sloths live up in the trees, and so to get up there, I've got to use a harness and some ascenders and a rope and climb up there, and a sloth can move. They don't just sit there. They move about that fast, which is pretty slow. But if I have to climb up 100 feet into a tree, by the time I set my ropes up and I get up there to finally catch a sloth, it might be two or three trees away. So then I have to come down, I've got to reset my lines, try again, and the sloth will look at me, and will kind of crawl away slowly, and they always go to the top of the, the tallest tree onto the end of the smallest branch so that I can't get them. So it's usually me getting outfoxed or outrun by a sloth. So I am actually slower than a sloth sometimes, and they're the world's slowest mammals. So it doesn't say much about my speed. But they can move fast, actually. They can actually bite you. I'm one of the few people who has the privilege of having been bitten by a sloth. I had to go to the hospital, and they had to sew my finger up and clean it out. The surgeon's looking at me, she's like, were you asleep when you were bitten by this animal? I've never heard of this. I'm like, okay. The patients are laughing, they're all like, ha, ha, ha. And it, I'm like crying because it hurts so bad. I'm worried they're going to lose my finger or something. The doctor looks at me and she's like, I want to remind you not to stick your finger down any more throats of sloths because that's really stupid. And I was like, okay, okay. And everyone's laughing. And she wrapped my hand up in a bright bandage. And everyone in the hospital knew. So everyone in the whole city knew. And they're all like, oh, you're that guy that was bitten by the sloth? And still people today ask me when I'm out in Gamboa, they're like, you're that guy that was bit by a sloth, aren't you? Did you get special powers? Like Spider-Man, when he was bit by the spider, he could do amazing things. Do you get really sleepy sometimes and like really lazy? There's a lot of jokes about this. So. <laughs> but one of the really cool things that I get to study about sloths is looking at their sleep patterns. And it's partly just because it's funny to talk about sleeping sloths. It's, it's hilarious. But they're actually a really neat animal. And a lot of people ask me then, well, why do you study sleep in sloths? Like, who cares? Well, everyone sleeps. Probably every one of us slept last night. And every animal ever studied has been shown to sleep. A fruit fly, a blue whale, a human, everything sleeps to some capacity. And actually, we don't really know why we sleep. All we know is that if we don't sleep, you'll die. So it's really important you do that. And sleep scientists can't really agree on what sleep does for us. The only thing they can agree upon is that you sleep because you're tired. That's it. We don't really know what it does for our bodies. And we know that it's really important. So instead of just studying sleep in humans or sleeping in rats, like a lot of scientists, I like to study sleep in fun animals, like koalas and sloths and frigate birds, because it's really fun, but also it's important to look at the diversity of sleep throughout the animal kingdom, because the way that a fruit fly sleeps is different than the way that a human sleeps, or different than the way that a sloth sleeps. So if I could look at all these different animals and see how they're sleeping, I can look at the differences and the similarities of sleep throughout the animal kingdom, and perhaps better understand why we sleep, which is kind of fun. And I get to catch sloths, which is really great. And you know, one interesting thing about sleep is that uh, it's not just your brain shutting off. And so you, when you ask a person, well, you know, what's happening when you're sleeping? Sometimes they're dreaming, sometimes they're doing things. You know, your brain is not just going offline. It's actually firing 
in a different pattern, in a different way. And to study sleep and sloths, I have these little tiny computer devices that go on their head that record their brain waves. So you can study sleep in some animals by just looking at them and saying, oh, well, she's asleep, or he's asleep, or that thing is not asleep, it's awake. But it's really difficult to tell with a sloth because they're sedentary and they just sort of sit there. And so I have to use these devices to record an EEG, an electroencephalogram. And through that, then I can look at the brainwave patterns and I can determine when it's sleeping, how it's sleeping. If it's in REM sleep, that's when your eyes are moving back and forth and you're dreaming. If it's in non-REM sleep, and I can look at all this cool stuff with it. And one thing that I focus on, though, is only working with wild animals. Partly because I like to run around the rainforest because it's really fun, but because studying animals in captivity, it's not the same as studying a natural animal. If I studied sleep in humans, how many of you have slept overnight on a flight somewhere, gone to Europe or something? It's really, you know, not easy to sleep on a flight. You maybe get a couple hours and it's not that great. If I was to only ever study sleep in humans on airplanes flying to Europe, I'd have a pretty weird perception of how we sleep. So if I only look at animals in a zoo, it's the same kind of thing because physiologically, it's like a different species if you compare the captive versus the wild individuals there. And the same is true for sloths. The first ever wild sleep study was with sloths. And we found that a sloth in captivity sleeps 15 to 16 hours a day. That's pretty slothful. That's pretty lazy. That's, that's, that's a lot. That's more than I sleep. But if we look at sloths in the wild, they only sleep 9 to 10 hours a day, which is a heck of a lot less. And so you think, well, why would it be such a difference between captivity versus the wild? Well, in a zoo, you know, sometimes you see the lion kind of restlessly going around looking depressed. You know, there's a lot of differences that you see in captivity versus the wild. They don't have any friends. They're not going to get eaten by something. And so it's really almost like a different species altogether when you look at the wild animals. Now, there's another cool study that I did with sloths looking at predation pressure. So sleep evolved in every sort of thing, from flies to whales to humans and all these things. But there's a lot of differences. Now, with prey animals and predators, there's a lot of differences of when they sleep. So prey animals tend to sleep at opposite times as the predators. So a sloth, for instance, gets eaten a lot at nighttime by ocelots. So for a sloth to be up at a tree safely sleeping, it's a good idea that they sleep at the opposite time as a predator. So I looked at two populations of sloths in Panama. One, the mainland, with high predation, where they get eaten all the time by ocelots. Another, on this island off the coast of Panama, where they live this totally relaxed Caribbean lifestyle. They sit in mangrove trees and just enjoy the sunshine. And I found there's a huge difference in the way they sleep. Actually, the ones in the mainland have exactly what I predicted. They sleep at opposite times of their predators. At nighttime, they're totally asleep. Whereas the guys on the islands, they don't have any predators to fear, so they have sleep patterns whenever they want to. They can be awake and asleep and playing around in the ocean and stuff. They actually swim, too. And so it's very interesting to see how maybe the sleep patterns have adapted around predation pressures. Now, as a scientist, I'm responsible for sharing this information with the public. And so we, as scientists, we write journal articles. It's peer-reviewed journal articles. I have to pay to publish these things, and they're reviewed by their scientists, and they go out to the scientific community. But there's something funny that a lot of people not in academia aren't aware of. Those are not accessible to everyone. If you guys wanted to read my last journal article that I wrote about pygmy sloths, you've got to pay for it. I have to pay for it. I don't even have access to the journal. So it's kind of funny. I write an article that I can't even read. So I got into science through television many years ago being down here. And so I've always tried to share my information with as many people as possible. So I've hosted tons of TV shows, written blogs, articles for different newspapers and magazines, trying to get people excited about sloths, because sloths are so much fun. And I find that people want to learn about this stuff. And so I think it's really important that we as scientists share our information with people. And a lot of the older scientists don't really see the, the point of that. They want to just publish these journal articles so other scientists can read them and sit there and, and say that's a great thing. But I think it's amazing that if I write an article, maybe 100 people read it. But if I do a TV show, I did a, a kid's show that 10 million people watched. That's such a, a powerful tool to be able to share information about science or conservation or sloths or anything you want to. And so I think it's really important that we as scientists share with the community. Now, the population of sloths that I worked on with the no predators on this island, they're actually pygmy sloths. They're really cool. They're 40% smaller than a standard three-toed sloth. They're only found on this one island off the coast of Panama, a scudo de Veraguas. They're awesome. Super cool animal, really relaxed. You can walk right up to them, touch their hair. They don't care. Normal sloths don't do that. They'll bite you. It's not good. And they're, they're really cool animals. But the people in Boca del Toro and the area around there weren't really aware that it's an endemic special species. And they're actually critically endangered. There's only a few hundred of them in the whole world. And they're all on this one island. 
When I first started going out there about 10 years ago, every time I'd go there, you'd hear chainsaws cutting down mangroves and trees and people you know, really destroying the island very quickly. Well, we started doing a lot of um, public outreach conservation efforts. So I did a lot of TV shows out there with the BBC, with some Japanese crews, some American crews, trying to raise the profile of the pygmy sloth in Panama and around the world. And it worked. People now all over the world email me and say, oh, I saw your program about pygmy sloth. That's so cool. That's so great. They're actually going to be one of the flagship species of BBC's new series coming out this fall called Planet Earth 2. So watch for that. It would be really neat. And the people in the community, they all now know about pygmy sloths. They're all aware that there's this really cool miniature baby sloth that's super cute that only lives on this one island, they belong there. So many people are aware of this, actually, that a few years ago, when an American zoo tried to export some of these sloths legally, they had permits that they got somehow, the local people said no. Even the police stepped up and they said, I don't care if you have permits. These sloths are ours. They belong here on this island and nowhere else. They actually went on their private airplane, took the sloths off, and brought them back to the island. And so the people really rose up. And that's a really, I think, powerful example of how people really do care about their environment. And if they're aware of what's going on out there, then they really do take ownership of that. And I think as scientists, we need to do as much as we can to share our information with people so that we can help conserve the environment. Now, no sloth talk is complete without a sloth. They wouldn't let me bring an actual sloth here. But I got something almost as good. We have a three-toed sloth. This is about mm, the size of a small pygmy sloth. So, and they've got three fingers, three toes. But did you guys know that all sloths have three toes? All sloths have three toes. So in English, we say toes. In Spanish, you say titos. Exactly. In German, they say finger. But in English, I just think it's easier to say toe than finger. So for some reason, they say, oh, yes, yeah, so the two-toed sloth and the three-toed sloth. But actually, they all have the same number of toes. It's the number of fingers that differs. So this one, three-toed, but also three-fingered. And this little baby. This is one of my sleep study sloths. See the little Abraham Lincoln hat in the top? That's a microcomputer that can record their brain waves. All I do is I put that on with super glue. Totally cool. Works on people, too. This is a pygmy sloth. See how adorable they are? Little tiny thing, sitting in the trees. They're, just, they're very, very cool animals. They swim in the ocean, too. Very cool. This is a two-toed sloth. Mm, grumpy the sloth. He's not very happy here. He's got a radio collar on. Two-toed sloths actually can move very quickly. They can be aggressive. And sometimes when I'm in the tree, they'll look at me, and they'll just start going after me, swiping and trying to take, take me out. Whereas the three-toed sloths don't usually care. Sometimes the two-toed sloths can get so angry and aggressive, they'll really be scary. And that's like the one that bit me in the finger. And that earned me a couple of nicknames. One of them is Jefe de Perezosos. But the one that I like better is Perezoso de Cinco Dedos, the five-toed sloth. And that's what my parents like to call me. I'm the five-toed sloth. Thank you. <laughs>